Good morning. Good morning and welcome. This is Mr. B's Sunday School. I am Mr. B, also known as Bruce Ehrlich, and today we're here with a lesson we're calling Day of Rest. Okay, so first thing we like to do in this class is pray. Thank you, Lord, for being with us as we read and talk about your word. Bless now the reading of your word. Help us to place all of our confidence in you. Help us to rest in the work that you have completed, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so first thing is we got a story for you. Now, this story is an old story. This goes back to when I was a kid. And when I was a kid, the stores were closed on Sundays. At least once a month, we would have a potluck at church. We would bring everything we needed for that day to church with us on Sunday morning. There was Sunday school for both children and adults, then morning service, then we would all spend what seemed like a couple of hours putting together a lunch and spend a couple more hours just visiting and eating. People really knew how to cook when I was a kid. Then we would have extended times for dessert, coffee, and rest. After that, we had evening service. On Sundays, when we did not have potlucks, we would have guests over for lunch, or we would go to other people's houses for lunch. All of this was perfectly normal for our family and for all of the Christian families that I knew of. Sundays were special when I was a kid. We called them the Lord's Day. And the Lord's Day was reserved for resting and eating and spending time and visiting. We called it fellowshipping. Fellowshipping was for all of our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Big families, small families, singles, and the elderly. Everyone enjoyed the day of rest. We got a little bit of an introduction for you. God loves the nation of Israel. God also loves the non-Jewish Church of Christ. I'm not a Jew, but I am a member of the Church of Christ. Whether we are Jewish believers or non-Jewish believers, we have a day to rest. In today's reading, God is speaking to the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom, about their sins. How their sins have become etched into their hearts like words chiseled on stone and how God mercifully provides them with another opportunity to repent and avoid painful judgment. God is basically saying, you're not keeping any of the commandments, so if you could at least keep one commandment, then there would be hope. Then you could avoid judgment. Now, we remember from the Garden of Eden that God did not make it complicated for Adam and Eve. He just gave them one commandment. But they couldn't keep it. So, too, in today's reading, we find God speaking and actively proclaiming a very simple message. You've blown it. Your heart is fully set on sin. But could you 
just do one simple thing. Could you just rest one day of the week? That sounds simple to me. Let's see how that works out in today's lesson. Our first reading is from Jeremiah 17. And we're going to read just the first four verses. The sin of Judah is written down with an iron stylus. With a diamond point, it is engraved upon the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars. As they remember their children, so they remember in detail their pagan altars and their asherim beside green trees on the high hills. O oh, Jerusalem, my mountain in the countryside, I will give to the Babylonians as the cost of your sin, your wealth, and all your treasures as plunder. And throughout your territory, your high places of sin, and you will, through your own fault, let go of your grip on your inheritance that I gave you, and I will make you serve your enemies in a land which you do not know, for you have kindled a fire in my anger, which will burn forever." Okay, we get a note, it says. Let's take a look and see. A note. Yeah, no, here we go. This phrase, let go of your grip on your inheritance, when used in the context of land, usually refers to letting the land lie fallow during the sabbatical year. Judah's captivity would provide rest for the land from the idolatrous activities of its people. Okay. Now we have a reading from Nelson's new illustrated Bible dictionary. Now we're going to do just a little short section on what they say about Jeremiah. Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet because he would wept openly about the sins of his nation. He was also depressed at times about the futility of his message. As the years passed and his words of judgment went unheeded, he lamented his unfortunate state. O oh Lord, you induced me, and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. Jeremiah did not weep and lament because of weakness, nor did he proclaim evil because of a dark and gloomy personality. He cried out because of his love for his people and his God. This characteristic of the prophet is actually a tribute to his sensitivity and deep concern. Jeremiah's laments remind us of the weeping of the Savior. All right, we've got a reading for you now from Cheryl's New International Version Study Bible. And we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. And these, uh, this is a red letter edition. So this is Jesus speaking. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together 
as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And uh, if you haven't already done so, you might want to get something to drink, maybe a snack. Uh, definitely want to run and get a Bible. If you don't have one already, kind of follow along here. Uh, we've got a little note here for you. Uh, it says, Jesus wanted to gather his people together as a hen protects her chicks under her wings, but they wouldn't let him. Jesus also wants to protect us if we will just come to him. Many times we hurt and don't know where to turn. We reject Christ's help because we don't think he can give us what we need. But who knows our needs better than our Creator? Those who turn to, to Jesus will find that He helps and comforts as no one else can. Okay. We got a reading from. Our new, what is this? It says the Spiritual Growth Bible. It's a New Living Translation. And we're reading uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited, salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. A little note here for you. Um, through Jeremiah, the Lord describes the hearts of the Israelites as wayward, hard-hearted, and proud. In chapter 17, the Lord accuses the people of worshiping idols, trusting in their own strength, and pursuing wealth by unjust means. It is not surprising, therefore, that he declares that the human heart is most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. In Hebrew thinking, the heart was the center of the intellect and will and the source of character, motives, and decisions. If the heart is corrupt then the whole person is beyond cure and without hope. We may think we are doing fine, but our motives and actions can reveal something different. 
And the Lord searches our hearts and examines our motives. Proverbs says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. However, there is hope. Later in Jeremiah comes the promise of a renewed heart for all Judah, the result of a new covenant between the Lord and his people. The Lord says that though the corrupt heart has been engraved with the sin of Judah, it will be restored with a heart engraved with the commands of the Lord. All right, now yesterday I had the rare privilege of discussing in depth a topic I don't get to hear a lot about, superheroes. Now, as I said, I don't know a lot about superheroes. And the person I was speaking with was an absolute authority on the subject. I took several pages of notes as we discuss the unusual powers, the strange characteristics, and the bizarre experiences of Spider-Man, Batman, Wonder Woman, Superman, Captain America, Thor, Iron Man, the Green Hornet, The Incredible Hulk, Wolverine, and the list goes on and on. After we spoke for a couple of hours about superheroes and what makes them so fascinating, I started to see a trend developing. Not only do all superheroes have weaknesses, but the thing that makes superheroes so interesting is their character flaws. So I got to thinking, is there one character flaw that we all share? I think there is. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned. Where can we go to find rest from our weaknesses and our character flaws. Got a reading for you from the Amplified Study Bible. And we are now in the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 4 today. First of all, verses 1 through 3 says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still remains and is freely offered today, let us fear in case any one of you may seem to come short of reaching it or think he has come too late. For indeed we have had the good news of salvation preached to us just as the Israelites also, when the good news of the promised land came to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because it was not united with faith in God by those who heard. For we who believe, that is, we who personally trust and confidently rely on God, enter that rest so we have his inner peace now because we are confident in our salvation and assured of his power, just as he has said, as I swore an oath in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. This he said, although his works were completed from the foundation of the world. 
waiting for all who would believe. All right. Now we have a quote for you. Today's quote is from one of our favorites, C.H. or Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And he says, If Christ has died for me, ungodly as I am, without strength as I am, then I cannot live in sin any longer. I must arouse myself to love and serve him who has redeemed me. I cannot trifle with the evil that killed my best friend. I must be holy for his sake. How can I live in sin when he has died to save me from it? All right, we got a reading from Cheryl's New International Study Bible, and we are in Jeremiah 17, and we're going to read verses 11 through 18. Like a partridge that hatches eggs it did not, did not lay is the man who gains riches by unjust means. When his life is half gone, they will desert him, and in the end, he will prove to be a fool. A glorious throne, exalted from the beginning, is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Let's get this thing going again here. There we go. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. For you are the one I praise. They keep saying to me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it now be fulfilled. I have not run away from being your shepherd. You know I have not desired the day of despair. What passes my lips is open before you. Do not be a terror to me. You are my refuge in the day of disaster. Let my persecutors be put to shame, but keep me from shame. Let them be terrified, but keep me from terror. Bring on them the day of disaster. Destroy them with double destruction. Okay. Another reading for you from Amplified Study Bible. This time we're reading Hebrews 4. Um, is that right? Yeah, 6 through 7. 6 and 7. Therefore, since the promise remains for some to enter his rest, and those who formerly had the good news preached to them failed to grasp it, and did not enter because of their unbelief, as evidenced by disobedience, he again sets a definite day, a new today, providing another opportunity to enter that rest by saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Okay. Got a reading from the Tanakh. Sometimes we call this Jen's Bible. My wife's best friend gave me this Bible. Uh, we're reading from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, and verses 19 through 27. 
Thus has the Lord said to me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, through which the kings of Judah enter, and through which they exit. And in all the gates of Jerusalem say to them, Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah, and all of Judah, and all inhabitants of Jerusalem who enter through these gates. Thus said the Lord, Beware for your souls. Do not carry a burden on the Sabbath day to bring it into the gates of Jerusalem. And do not bring a burden out from your houses on the Sabbath day. You shall not do any manner of work. Sanctify the Sabbath day as I commanded your forefathers. But they did not listen and did not incline their ear. They stiffened their neck in order not to hear in, in, and in order not to accept rebuke. And it shall be that if you truly listen to me, the word of the Lord, not to bring a burden into the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, and to sanctify the Sabbath day, not to do any manner of work on it, then kings and princes who sit upon the throne of David will enter the gates of this city riding chariots and horses, and they and their officers, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city will be inhabited forever. And people will come from the cities of Judah and from the environs of Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin, from the lowland, from the mountain, and from the south, bringing burnt offerings, peace offerings, meal offerings, and frankincense, and bringing thanksgiving offerings to the temple of the Lord. But if you do not listen to me to sanctify the Sabbath day, and not carry a burden and enter the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will set a fire to its gates, which will consume the palaces of Jerusalem and not be extinguished. All right, we only have a special time in our class called Synonym Time. And today's word is rest, R-E-S-T. Now, some of my, there are a lot of synonyms for this word, but my favorite synonyms are vacation, break, calmness, comfort, composure, refreshment, relaxation, Relief, quiet, peace, downtime, holiday, intermission, breathing space, pause, and time off. Okay, our last reading for today is from the book of Hebrews, and we're looking at chapter 4, verses 11 through 14, reading from the Amplified Study Bible. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest of God, to know and experience it for ourselves, so that no one will fall by following the same example of disobedience as those who died in the wilderness. For the Lord, for I'm sorry, for the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective, 
It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. And not create, no, I'm sorry, and not a creature exists that is concealed from his sight, but all things are open and exposed and revealed to the eyes of him with whom we have to give an account. And as much then as we, believers, have a great high priest who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith and cling tenaciously to our absolute trust in him as Savior. All right. A little bit of a class roundup for you. God has gifted each of us with special talents, and each of us, by God's grace, have developed skills and abilities. However, each of us also have weaknesses and a severe character flaw called sin or the urge to sin, that we must contend with. In this modern 24-7 world that is so full of noise and confusion, it is good to know that we can have a time for rest, a place for rest, and that we can know the person of rest, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who has completed the work of salvation, who can restore our relationship with God and provide us with the rest we need if we simply trust in him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord for this time we've had in your word. Help us to rest in you this week. Bless the reading of your word for each of us this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Have a good week.